There exists a very classic plot element in literature and video games, the political and spiritual significance of which we cannot underestimate. I like to call it the Grey Goo ending. In short, it boils down to an attempt by the villain to achieve world peace or world domination, which is the same thing, by turning man into an undifferentiated, unified slime of some form, unthinking, undivided, depraved, and bereft of humanity, who are ruled by a centralized government or empire. Dagoth Ur from The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind has a master plan to cover the world in a disease called Corporis, which will grant people a counterfeit form of immortality. It rots their minds, turns them into zombies, and ultimately prevents the possibility of the outbreak of war by creating a massive population of unified sheep. The Borg from Star Trek have a similar plan. They aim to achieve technical and biological perfection and unification through the assimilation of the races into a hive mind, where they lose all individuality and thus any possibility of disagreement or internal conflict. Another notable example are the Necrons from Warhammer 40,000, who have traded their biological forms for cybernetic ones. Again, the theme of counterfeit worldly immortality appears. Their aim is to gain complete control over the galaxy, to establish an orderly galactic imperium. If all this sounds very similar to the plans of the New World Order and Agenda 2030, you would be correct, including the concept of post-human immortality. But this theme is not new, and the theme is traceable back before modern media. The idea of a sacred empire is timeless and primordial according to the traditionalists. We might think of the coming kingdom of Christ, or the spiritual center of Hyperborea, Shambhala, or the mythology of the Holy Roman Empire, and so on. Even the Catholic Edward Fieser has written a great article on the ontological necessity of a universal sacred empire that brings divine peace and order to the world. In the article, though, he expands on the premise and identifies that there can and must be an inverted version of it that precedes the establishment or re-establishment, depending on your view, of the upright and sacred version of the empire. Thus, the satanic kingdom of the beast is conceivable as opposed to the kingdom of Christ. The character Dagoth Ur is perhaps the most literal example of this inverted empire, as it is stated that, quote, in Dagoth Ur, all are one in flesh, end quote an inversion of the Christian doctrine that all are spiritually one in Christ. As I've already written, Carl Schmidt wrote an essay on the same subject on political unity, which you should definitely read, and I'll put a link to that in the description. Traditionalist Charles Upton addresses this subject in his book System of Antichrist, and to a certain extent in his book Dugan Against Dugan. The empire of the Antichrist will in many ways resemble the universal empire, the Sacrum Regnum, except it will be a shadow of it. The Antichrist will perform miracles, causing the many to believe him and to follow him. He will establish an orderly global state, bringing together the scattered fragments of humanity under one banner by traveling the earth from east to west. The way the Antichrist will make whole these fragments, however, is not by putting them into their proper places in the stained glass window of reality. Rather, he will try to amalgamate them, to turn them into a mixture such as the Tower of Babel or the Cup of the Whore who rides upon the beast. This amalgamation is a symbol of the gathering up of psychic fragments, tangible balls of language and ideas and sentiments. Postmodernism is, in some ways, the very same thing, as is Alexander Dugan's philosophy of trash, as he calls it. A concrete example of the gathering that Upton gives is the World Faith Initiative, in which globalist entities promote syncretism, the following of multiple faiths at once, and general spiritual promiscuity. It should be obvious that this is not in good faith, since the religions of the world are mutually exclusive in their dogma. As Jesus says, a house divided cannot stand. Conflicts and contradictions would cause the system to implode if it were not backed by force. Nonetheless, there is an effort to create a world religion, which is similar to Madame Blavatsky's theosophy, and various attempts at global alchemy and the spiritual evolution of mankind popularized by French-Jewish occultist Eliphas Levi and many Masonic and Fabian socialist figures. On the political plane, this amalgamation takes the form of anti-racism, genetic denialism, race denialism, anti-white racism, diversity initiatives, mass migration, miscegenation forced or encouraged by the state, and other similar kinds of policies. 
The NWO's wisdom is that human difference, represented by racialism and race realism, causes conflict, while human homogeneity, which for some reason is called diversity, is the golden road to peace. To this end, they aim to transform the demographics of every state, encouraging the emergence of a featureless mixed-race population a la Kodenhov Kalergi. They encourage cultural intermixing, not just exchange, but syncretism, in an effort to displace the European races and to join them into a global whole. Rather than seeing humanity as differentiated and segmented, the NWO sees man as one humanity, as global citizens. Borders will be dissolved, nationalities and cultures will be rolled into a single tent. This is the Grey Goo ending. Dagoth Ur activates a Kulakon. Everyone is infected with corpus and becomes a, quote, immortal stone. The globalists of pre-modernity, such as Dante Alighieri and other Guelphists, also believe that man ought to imitate the universal empire in order to achieve world peace. However, they had the opposite solution to the question of diversity, which was derived from the Bible and natural law. In particular, they properly saw true diversity as the principle of order, and amalgamation or false diversity as the principle of chaos. Every child knows that when you mix paint indiscriminately on a palette, you just get black or you get brown, rather than anything approaching the beautiful and multicolored reality that is human differentiation. This is simply intelligible as the truth. The Guelphic idea was to govern impartially over separate nations of people that are nonetheless answerable to a central authority. This is somewhat similar to Dugan's idea of multipolarity. This is based on the natural law principle of the difference of kinds. God intended peoples to be diverse and distinct, which is why they are different in a state of nature. To violate this is to violate the will of God. We can see that this is not the great goo ending, no matter how impossible it might be to achieve under strictly human willpower. And thankfully, they conceive of no worldly immortality, keeping immortality rightly in the spiritual wheelhouse. We can see clearly, then, that there is an upward direction, the universal empire, and a downward direction, the system of Antichrist. The former is spiritual, while the latter is worldly. The former is based on categorical order, whereas the latter is based on formless chaos. This should allow one to realize truly how ontologically evil our enemy is, and how, unconsciously and truthfully, this very evil is reflected as absolutely villainous in story writing. What a fool you are. I'm a god. How can you kill a god? What a grand and intoxicating innocence.